Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me. I see a lot of familiar faces and call signs here. I've probably been to W9 VXCC at least 40 years and looking forward to attending again this year. So we're going to talk about antennas in the third dimension tonight. If you're thinking about buying a new antenna, you'll go and look at the brochure and you look at the antenna patterns. You'll probably see an antenna pattern that is uh, in only the X and Y planes. And it'll be at, specified at some angle, probably one that the marketing department thinks will make it uh, uh, look the best. But there's it's actually a, a 3D pattern, as, as we probably know, and it's affected by things like antenna height. But it's also affected by other things like uh, the terrain around you. And that's been, a, until now, been a very difficult thing to predict. And so it's kind of been ignored. And I, uh, we're going to look at that and see why the, the third dimension is important. Okay, what's going on here? Okay, so we're going to take a look at why antenna and takeoff angles are important, what affects those angles, and what we can do about it. A lot of you know me, but here's a quick bio. I've been licensed over 50 years. Um, my main interests are contesting, DXing, and designing and building equipment and antennas. Probably most well known for my column in the NCJ, which I did from 1985 through last year on contesting tips, tricks, and techniques. Um, went to the University of Wisconsin Madison, where I majored in ham radio with a minor in electrical engineering. I uh, I retired about five six years ago. Somewhere along the lines. Uh, home project got out of control and I ended up getting into the ham radio business. Um, the company's Unified Microsystems. And right now my, uh, my, my flagship product is a BevFlex. It's a low, low band uh, switchable bi-directional low band antenna. Um, had those as prizes uh, for the last couple of years at uh, W9DXCC and maybe one of you were lucky enough to win one of those. Belong to a lot of radio organizations more than I can even remember. These are the ones that I'm I currently have uh, official positions in, and uh, I lived about 25 miles northwest of Milwaukee. So, a few comments. I've given this talk a few times. A lot of them to to overseas and and the and West Coast and stuff. And this is oriented from the Midwest because that's where I'm interested. Um, since you guys are also in us, a lot of this stuff would apply directly. Um, uh, but even if it didn't, the principles are the same. I use a lot of software that came with the ARL antenna handbook or the antenna book. Um, if you don't have this book, you should get it. I think the software alone is worth the price of the book. You can buy the software, get the, buy the book, get the software, and throw the book away, and you'll still come out ahead, but don't throw away the, the book. The first one is a program called EasyNet, which is an antenna modeling program. I've been using the paid version of that for probably 20, 25, 30 years, uh, written by W7EL. Now, the one version that's in the antenna book is a limited version, but he recently retired, and he decided to release the full version. So if you go to his website, you can buy, you download for free the full professional version. Uh, there's uh, there's no support, but there's also no cost, so I'd suggest you do that. The other program is HFTA, HF Terrain Assessment by Dean Straw and 6BV. And this allows you to model antennas based on your actual local terrain. If you're on a hill or in a valley or whatever, you can figure that in. And it uses terrain profiles. Um, the U.S. Geological Survey has maps, you know, topographical maps of the whole United States. And K6TU has a service where you can send him your latitude and longitude out to like six or eight digits. And he'll send you back some files that show what the terrain is like every degree from, from zero to 359 degrees around the compass. And so you can go and use that to uh, see what your antenna uh, patterns are going to be based on your actual terrain. <laughs> So the first question is, what are your HF operating activities? Well, if you're a rag chewer for local, you do local nets, a traffic handler, or 
maybe you are involved with HF emergency communication, you're probably mostly interested in the high angles. Well, this group of course is DXers and you know we're, we're gonna be interested in the low mm -hmm. angles. Now I'm a contester, I know there's a few others here that are, are contesters and we're interested in all the angles because we wanna, we wanna work everybody. And so how do we use our antennas to uh, be most efficient to make the most contacts based on on the end, the angles of our signals. So if we want to make a contact, we know our friend the ionosphere is very important. We send a signal up and hopefully it gets uh, refracted back to Earth at some some distance. Uh, now some people say it's reflected. Technically, it's not. It's actually refracted. Although sometimes thinking as a reflected just makes it a little bit easier to think about. But if we send a signal into space, it'll get to the ionosphere and it'll start to get bent. And if conditions are right, it'll keep getting bent and bent and bent and it'll come back down to Earth. And the frequency uh, is going to have a big effect here. The higher the frequency, the less effect that the ionosphere is going to have. So it's harder for it to bend that signal. So let's say we set a signal up at a certain angle at low frequency. It'll get to the ionosphere and it'll be refracted back. As we keep increasing the frequency, we'll get to a point where it's bent, but it's not bent enough to come all the way back. And it goes off into space and that energy is lost to us. And that's caused the maximum usable frequency. Now the maximum usable frequency is gonna depend on the state of the ionosphere, you know, time of the day, sunspot count, all that good stuff. And also the angle, um, that it is the lower the angle the higher frequency we can have because if we got a very low angle that signal does not have to be refracted back you know that many degrees the worst case is if we send the signal straight up it's got to do 180 degrees to come back down down to earth and that frequency is called the critical frequency or f not f zero this is going to be a lot lower i just checked about oh and about an hour and a half ago i checked the Anasand and Michigan, and it said the MUF to 3,000 kilometers was about 20 megahertz, so just under 15 meters. And that's about 1,850 miles. Um, the MUF would be at that range. But the, the critical frequency was 5.5 megahertz. So if we wanted to contact somebody that's outside the skip zone, we would have to do it probably on 75 or 80 meters or lower because even 40 meters I would not support that. So the question is, what signals angles do the, uh, what angles do the signals come from? Well, HFTA has some plots and it's got some some interesting data, and these are some plots from W nine to different parts of the world on twenty meters. Ignore the blue line; uh, that's uh, that's not important here. But the vertical lines are the probability that the band is open to a location reading over and seeing what the probability is that the signal is coming in from this angle. So if we have, if the band is open to Europe on 20, there's an 11% chance that that signal is arriving at nine degrees. And you can see anywhere from one degree and depending how far we go out, uh, like and here we got to 24 degrees, but the chances of coming in at 24 degrees is less than 1%. And you can see the different uh, locations generally the farther the station the the lower the the maximum angle that that the uh, propagation is going to be now these are based statistically based over the entire sunspot cycle so they're going to be skewed depending where we are in a sunspot cycle if, and also with the band opening if for example we're at the bottom of the sunspot cycle and we're here in Europe, it's probably going to be at the lower angles. Or if the now if the we're getting better conditions, if the band opens, it's just opening or just closing, it's going to be at the lower angles. But as the opening uh, gets better and the sunspot count gets better, we're going to have more of the um more of these at the higher angles. So you can see there's quite a difference between on uh, and 20 meters to the different uh, continents from W9. So what about how to, from band to band? Well, here we've got the plots from W9 to Europe. Here we see 40 meters. 
And I see we have them going out pretty far. 20 meters, not uh, about the same. 15 meters, not so far. And 10 meters, we can see it's uh, not very far at all. And 10 is kind of interesting to get this this gap in here where it's, it's not going to occur. It's, most of the time it's going to be here, but it, it really hunts a high sunspot count. So we might get some openings at these angles. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is we might have openings on, on multiple uh, angles. We might have like a three a three hop path and a four hop path open at the same time. So we actually have the signals, two set signals split at different uh, incoming angles. So how does this match up with our, our antennas? Well, here's a vertical pattern for a 20 meter three element Yagi at 70 feet over flat terrain. And we see we've got a couple of lobes here, some back lobes. Now the main lobe here is at a pretty good angle. This antenna is going to be pretty good for DX because a lot of the stuff's coming in over here. We got another angle up here. This is not going to be very good for for DXing. If we're chasing the, the rare one, uh, this is power that's lost. But it might be, you know, if we're talking the East Coast or 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 you know someplace else in the United States, this this could be very important. But if the signal's coming in at this angle, we're in pretty good shape. The signal's coming in at this angle is pretty good shape. But what if the signal's coming at one of these red angles? Well, you can see if it's coming in here, we're almost 20 dB down from our main lobe. So this is not very good for us. Um, we would like to have uh, have that uh, cover all the different angles. So you can see where um, at, at a given time, you might have a very strong signal, but then as conditions change a little bit, you might not have a very good signal because we're coming in at the null of a load. So why does this happen? Well, if we have an elevated antenna, we'll be sending off signals and let's say this blue line, this is kind of the range of our useful signals to our DX. But then we also have some signals that are going to bounce off the ground in an area called the Fresnel zone. And these signals will bounce off. And when they get to the match up with the direct path ones, they're going to add and subtract depending on their phase. If they add together in the same phase, the signal will increase and we have gain. But in the directions where they're out of phase, they'll cancel each other and we'll have a big null. So that's that's why the height above ground is very important because these are going to change the angles. And as I've seen a second, the terrain is also going to be very important. So just to kind of the key points right now, the higher the antenna, the lower the main lobe, but higher antennas will produce multiple lobes. And of course, we're gonna see the terrain is gonna have a big effect. So this is the terrain for my station um, here in Slinger, near Slinger, Wisconsin. And uh, we're showing 20 meters. Now I live in an area called the Kettle Moraine. This is where the glaciers stopped. And they left big mounds of gravel and sand and stuff that are big hills called moraines. And there's a lot of areas where where the uh, ice was in the ground and then it melted. It, it, the, the, the ground formed deep kettles, they call them. So we have these hills, very hilly around here of different heights, different heights. Um, and some of these hills can be very steep. Some of the hills are pretty big. Some are pretty small. My house is uh, on the top of one of these that got leveled off. Now, I'm at a little over 1,100 feet above sea level, um, but it drops off very steeply here. Um, you know, it, it, even at, at the one edge of my property, the southern edge of my property, it's basically it, uh, a very steep drop of about 10 feet to the, uh, to the, uh, to the road. If I'm going to the northeast, what this shows, it drops off pretty steeply for about 50 feet. Um, and then it goes out to an area, they call it Mud Lake. It's, it's, a, it's a marsh, it's only about three feet deep. And then if we go further away, we see some hills. Now, first of all, you look, geez, I'm looking right into a hill here towards Europe, that can't be good. Well, actually it's not. If you look at the scale here, we've got a little under 140 feet here. But this is about two miles away. So that's really only about one degree above the horizon. So our signals are going over that. It's not a problem. But down here is very interesting. One way you can look at this 
is I've got here about 45 or 50 feet of essentially effective antenna tower height because the hill drops off so fast. But I also have some reflections off this land here and down here. So here we have the plot oh, yeah. with the takeoff angles to Europe. The blue line would be, I have a TH7, so I'm just calling it a four element Yagi at 50 feet. And if I had this on flat land, a four element Yagi at 50 feet would produce this pattern. Well, you can see the things peaking out here where we don't have a whole lot of openings and half of my power is gonna be at, at, at uh, angles that are not gonna be useful for DX. And then it's not gonna be very good at some of these lower angles. But because of the terrain, this is the calculated pattern that I got. You can see I picked up a whole lot at these lower angles. Now this is jagged and stuff because the ground is not nice and, and smooth. If it was a nice smooth roll uh, uh, slope, then this would look a lot cleaner, but this is what we've got. So this, this antenna works out quite well for into Europe. Now I kind of got into this stuff last summer um, when FT8 came out, people were starting to work DX on six meters. Um, I worked a bunch of DX around the year 2000, 2001, when we had a lot of F uh, skip on six meters, but I only got about 50 countries confirmed and I'd pretty much given up any hope of uh, getting DXCC on six. But with FT8, um, we found out that we could do multi-hop e-skip. Now e-skip is a sporadic e that happens in the spring and summer, and it's usually only good out to about 13, 1400 miles. But sometimes we can get multi hop and even several enough hops to get into Europe and South America and stuff. And um, even Japan, we will get you know, three to five openings into Japan, usually around July in the evenings. And some of my uh, local uh, six meter guys were telling me, yeah. I worked a dozen J's last night and six. And I go, I worked 20. And in two summers, I worked zero. And I was at most of those openings. And I could hear a few weak ones decode them, but they didn't hear me. So I started figuring out and somebody said, just why don't you do a terrain analysis? Well, my terrain to the Northwest, mostly almost just West and North is a whole lot different. Yeah, here I am at 12 or 1100 feet and my I'm up a little bit higher, it's on, it's on the same tower, but it's up another five feet. But less than a quarter of a mile, I'm looking into the top of a hill. This is pretty ugly. So what does this look like? Well, HFTA does not does not give you uh, patterns or, or probabilities for angles for six meters. Um, Carl Kane in LA has got an excellent paper on his, white, uh, on his website about takeoff angles on on for sporadic E on six meters. And he basically says it's it's, it's gonna be most of sporadic E is gonna be around in this range here, about under 15 degrees. Um probably the DX is coming in here. So here's the blue line is if my my current tower and antenna was on flat ground. We have two lobes uh two lobes here. Because as we know, as we get higher, you know, you get more lobes and and 55 feet is pretty high at, at, at six meters. So we have two lobes. So it's been good here. We're going to miss the stuff here. But um, let's take a look at what would happen if what I'm actually apparently getting. This is a red one. As you can see, this is really ugly. We have this nasty null here down in this eight or nine degrees, which I think is probably the angles that we get six meters you know, from Japan most of the time. So this is this is not good news. So I started looking in, into this a little bit and said, well, what could I do? Well, I found if I put a, a dipole at 30 feet, this green line here, you can see that was a whole lot better at these angles than my Yagi at 55 feet. Who would have thought that? And if I put a three element fixed or something, you know, I get even better. Well, I started to build a, a build a uh, dipole, but it's kind of the end of the season, so this is in, in 2021. So I, uh, so I, I, I never finished it. 
But then last year, I had a, I have a tower. It's about 19 feet for two meter moon bounce. And I haven't used it for quite a few years. And I, I did a trade and I got a five element Yagi for six meters. I took down the two meter stuff and put this thing on that tower. And so I've got a five element at, at uh, 20 feet roughly versus my three element. And here's some of the different plots. Europe, the, the blue one is the five element and uh, I don't know, so the, the red is the high one at three elements and the blue is the lower one. And you can see at real low angles that um, that the, the that the high one might work pretty good, and at different angles, you know, the 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 lower one went. And I use it for a few openings, and it it, it just depends. Sometimes one was better than the other. Um, now South America was just I don't have a terrain plot showing here, but South America drops that direction. It drops off very steeply, then a gentle slope for a very long ways, and this thing on to South America and even into the lower part of the U.S., the lower one is so much better um, uh, to, in that direction. It's, it wasn't uncommon for me to be listening to uh, stations down in uh, around the Gulf states or whatever that were at least two S units stronger on the lower antenna. Yeah, five elements versus three is going to make some difference, but I think almost all of it is 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 height. Well, what about some really long haul <laughs> stuff to Australia? Well, I've never worked Australia. We had we did get some sporadic E openings a while, but I think back in December to, to New Zealand. I I never heard them. I know a few guys around me heard them. I know a couple of guys in Madison actually made contacts. But here's how the antennas are going to compare at my location. You can see that at the lower angles, the high one's going to be better. Now, to to that direction, it kind of slopes off more gradually. So, and, and there's a ridge, you know, maybe three quarters of a mile away, but uh, it's not very high. So hopefully we'll get some F layers. They're, they're talking that we might have some F layer on six meters next uh, fall. And if that happens, and I'm sure the top antenna is gonna be more useful for the long DX. Um, so now I've, uh, need, I, I've learned that I need two antennas on, on six meters. So how do we prove the low angle takeoff? And so we mentioned the higher the antenna is, the more lobes you're going to have. Here's a 10 meter dipole at 60 feet. So we got a bunch, a bunch of uh, low angle uh, lobes. Our back isn't very. Uh, it's a dipole. I'm sorry. And we got some stuff straight up. Well, that's going to be pretty useful because as we saw earlier, that our critical frequency is is not going to be um, is not going to be uh, very useful. It's going to go right on straight into space. Um, here's a uh, a Yagi for 15 meters at 90 feet. And you can see a lot of the a lot of the fingers here. So we still have a lot of spaces where where um, you're going to have nulls depending on what angle the signal comes in. So so how do you clear out those nulls? Well, this is how K9CT does it. He just puts a big stack and puts a bunch of antennas at different <laughs> angles. Now most of us can't pull that off, but maybe we can do something. Let's take a look at 10 meters. These 10 meter antennas are a little bit smaller, more manageable. Here's a, a four element Yagi at 35 feet for 10 meters. You can see it's, you know, here it is, this blue line. You can see that uh, yeah, it's good for these openings that happen right here. It's not too bad down here in this area, but over here, it's not that great. So what if instead we put up at 65 feet and we get the red one? Well, now we see, because we're higher, we now have two lobes, and unfortunately, one of the, the the nulls is right in this area down here. We do pick up some. Well, what happens? If we take those two antennas and phase the two, and essentially combine the signals. Well, then we get this this blue line or green line here, which you can see covers all of our angles nicely, and 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 the area at, at the higher angles. It's not nearly as much energy, That's so we have less wasted. Well, I actually had this antenna for, in the early 90s. I had a, I had four elements at uh, 65 and, and, and over 35 feet, and I felt I, I ruled uh, 10 meters. It was just a really, really lot of fun to play with that. Um, 
I would notice there'd be times when the top antenna by itself is better than the stack. And I and, and I know a couple of times uh, during some contests at the peak, the, the lower antenna by itself was much better. Um, some of you guys know Randy K5ZD. I remember talking to him about the time and he was operating some big gun station in Pennsylvania. And, and I think he said his antenna was up at 120 feet. And he was getting beat out by uh, guys with tri-banders at 40 feet because he didn't have that low angle. Now, another way to get low angles is verticals. And of course, that's what's popular in the low bands. Um, not many people probably here have an 80 meter dipole or 80 meter Yagi. I'm sure none of you have anything for 160. Now, verticals don't have a lot of gain but they do have low angles. And as you saw earlier that, you know, gain in the wrong directions is wasted anyway. So let's, let's take a look when we have a, a, a vertical here. Um, here's a typical 40 meter vertical. You know, we got pretty wide range of lows, but we got some good stuff down to low. And as you remember, uh, we have a kind of a wide range of, uh, of angles for DX coming in at 40 meters. So this can, can work out pretty well. So I'm going to compare this here to some on 80 meters, a dipole and a vertical. Now, well, first of all, we try, let's look at a dipole at, at 40 feet. Well, you can see we're not doing very good. Um, even at the high angles here, we're less than an isotropic antenna, which is, you know, a theoretically, but a poor antenna is yeah. no gain. We just have, you know, it just isn't going to work very good. For DX. Well, if we raise to 80 feet, well, now we're doing a lot better. And even better if we can go up 120 feet. But you know, it's it's pretty hard for most of us to do a, a dipole on 80 meters, much more than 40 or 50 feet, maybe 80. 120 feet, you're gonna have to have some big towers or some really big trees to pull that off. Well, what about a vertical? HFT only works with horizontal antennas, so I had to do this and and I put it, I hope you can see this. I, I put it in with in in yellow. Well, we can see down around here to really low angles, it's at least as good as that dipole at 120 degrees. And it's better than the dipole at uh um at, at 80 feet. And it's always better up to this range, and it's always better than the, the dipole at 40 feet. So this can be pretty effective for us. Now, I know a lot of big gun stations in the East Coast swear by dipoles to 80 meters on 100, at 120 feet. And, for, you know, they're, they're a lot closer to Europe. And I can see why that can be pretty effective because you're covering a lot of the angles there. But um, I can't put up anything at 120 feet. I don't know if any of you guys can. I'm probably not the majority of people here. So what if we want to improve performance at the short range? Well. Remember this plot before we said that, you know, the, the critical frequency is going to be pretty low. So if we want to talk to somebody outside ground wave, um, we're going to have to do it on a pretty low frequency. So let's do some comparisons of 40 meter dipoles. Let's dipole at 40 feet as this pattern here. It's um, it's a good it's a good height for 40 meters for a lot of uses. If you lower it down to 27 feet, we get a little bit more gain at uh, 90 degrees, which if we want the short range stuff, that can be pretty good. If we lower it even lower to eight feet, we can pick up over two dB straight up. Now I've, in my 52 consecutive years of doing field day, I've been the 40 meter CW specialist for most of them. And I've played around with a lot of different antennas to try to make the biggest scores possible. And I've come to the conclusion that a dipole around 27 to 30 feet is best from this area. It seems to have the best gain into the population centers during the day. Um, yeah, being at, at that height, it's not so hard to put up. I have some military mass that's 30 feet, so that works out real well. But I've always trying something else to use in addition to that to get the other ones. Um, I have, I've kind of, I like a vertical antenna that I made, uh, that uses, uh, raised tuned radials. 
and that seems to help me a lot to the West Coast uh, in the wee hours of the morning. And I've played around with a, a dipole at, at eight feet, but there's some problems with dipoles that low. A dipole in free space has an impedance of around 70 some ohms. That's a pretty decent match to your 50 ohm system. But as you lower it down to around eight feet, the impedance drops to 12 ohms and that's not a very good match. So my solution is a, is a folded dipole, which has a higher impedance. And as I lower that, the impedance drops to about 50 ohms. Now, folded dipoles this is a misconception some people have. They're actually the same size and length as a regular dipole, but the construction is why they get the name folded. And here's here's the one that I use for field day. I originally got into this when we had a, uh, a guy from the Red Cross was giving a talk at the... Um, at the uh, local ARS meeting. And he says, well, you guys do can do a great job with the repeaters and stuff on, on your VHF stuff, but what if I need to talk to somebody in you know Minneapolis or Chicago or something, what can you do? And I kind of gave me a question. Yeah, we don't really have anything. And I started looking at this and said, not only would this be good for, uh, for field day, but it could be good for contesting too. So I made the thing portable so we can deploy it if we have to for an emergency, but also I can set it up for field day. So what I have is some fiberglass poles, about seven feet tall. The The dipole is a regular length for 40 meters. It's made with the twin lead. It's shorter at the, the ends and it's cut. One of the, the wires is cut in the middle and it's fed with coax. I have some ferrite beads here to act as an RF choke. Uh, most of the, the literature shows you having three radials underneath, the reflector wires underneath. Now, these are just wires that are just laid right in the ground. They're not, they're not, you know, stuck in the ground. There's no ground rods or anything. I just have little loops at the end, and I have some uh, wooden pegs that can pound in the ground just to keep the, the normal wires are all coiled up, and I want to keep them straight. They're a few feet longer than the, than the, the, the transmit antenna. And they're about three feet. Um, as I mentioned, I live on a on a pile of rocks, and when I tested this thing, it was very dry. And I put three radials in, and it was terrible SWR. So I started adding some more, and I found I needed seven. But then uh, one of the years I used it at field day, we had to move to a different site, and where I wanted to put it, it was kind of low, and it was we had a lot of rain, and I. It was kind of squishy ground. I laid down three radials and my feet were getting wet. And I said, I wonder if that's good enough. And I checked the SWR and it was fine. So it was, um, it was, uh, uh, that was enough. It just depends on the soil conditions. And if you want more information, you go to W9XD.com. I've got some more information on this and another information on radio stuff that I've done. Now, as I mentioned, I'm a contester, so I want to work all the angles. Um, so one of the conclusions I came is that you want to have multiple antennas as complementary as possible. So I have at least two antennas on every of the, the, the uh, contest bands, except for 160. And the secondary antennas don't necessarily have to be, be um, don't have to be expensive big ones. I, I do have a couple of towers and I have Yagi's for the, the higher bands, but I have... Uh, verticals and dipoles or yagis and dipoles. And um, so uh, that, that really helps because uh, uh, being able to switch the antenna and different takeoff angle uh, is often the difference and depending on the conditions. Like I came to the conclusion you can't have too many antennas until I, I read the book on radio propagation by KL7AJ and he's got a statement is, you can't have too many antennas until they are so close they interact. You, then you only have one antenna with multiple feed points. Now uh, that's a that's a problem, and that's something I want to do some more uh, investigating on um, uh, one of these days just to see how much interaction. I do know that, especially on the low bands, um, there things quite a ways away can um, cause interaction. I had a radio club meeting a couple of years ago. And the speaker was a guy who was a broadcast consulting engineer. He would go to broadcast AM stations and help them do stuff. And he went out to a station out in New Jersey. And the station was required to have a, have a certain pattern so it wouldn't interfere with um, 
with other stations and the AM station the same frequency. Maybe they wanted to have the pattern because they were near the ocean. There was no point in radiating out in the ocean. So they'd want to, you know, avoid that direction. So every year, I don't know exactly how often they had to go through and, and, and check the pattern to make sure that they were still meeting their FCC regulations. And he checked it and he found out, no, the pattern was no longer meeting their requirements. He traced it down to a new cell phone tower that was put up about a mile away. And that was causing the antenna pattern to change. So he had to go through all sorts of things to detune the cell to uh, towers. It's quite interesting, but it also shows that there's probably a lot more interaction be you know, between stuff around our houses and our antennas. Now, a couple of caveats here. Um, this uses computing modeling. There's an old computer saying garbage in, garbage out. So take everything with a grain of salt. Uh, we don't know how accurate the, accurate the models are. How accurate is the input data? How accurate is the, the uh, you know, US Geological Survey? It doesn't show tents or houses or something. It shows hills. Um, I forgot to mention on, on this when I was talking about six meters, Frank W3LPL and it's an excellent talk. It's a, you can find it on, on, on YouTube. Excuse me. About antennas for six meters. And he's convinced that 45 or 50 feet is a great height for for um, for antennas for six meters for, for sporadic E. And he's very concerned about houses in the Fresnel zone where the signals bounce for you. So that's a very, can, can really cause a lot of, of uh, change your pattern. Now I had a quibble with Frank. Now normally I'm not going to dispute anything he tells me about antenna and station engineering. The guy's the guy knows his stuff. But we had a discussion and I showed him my data and well it turns out he lives in a flat area. And so the 45 feet thing, 50 feet, which was a disaster for me, was probably very good for him or anybody else in a flat area. And when he gave the talk in uh, at Dayton, I sat in on it again, and he he mentioned that it could be uh, affected by your your your, your antenna. Um, how accurate are your are your your specs when you sent them in to get your 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 terrain plots? You know, um, you can get pretty good stuff off as of, off of Google Maps. Um, I had a, I had several GPS units, so I just sat next, you know, not too close to the tower. I didn't want to the signal, but I let them run for 45 minutes or so to really zero in on my location, and I use that. Um, ground variable conductivity could be a thing, and again, interaction with uh, other other uh, metal objects can affect your patterns. So, in summary, um, signals come at a lot of different angles, and it's going to depend on your location, your target location, uh, the uh, band, the time of the day sunspot conditions. And if we can figure out a way to match our antennas to what did their maximum gain at the, the angles that uh, match the signals coming in, we're going to do much better. Height and local terrain affect that, but we can also use the verticals and things that uh, on the higher bands. And NVIS antennas can be uh, uh, can can also be useful if you're interested in, in, in shorter range. I should mention when I used that, the first year I used that, uh, I was listening to, to a, I came across one of the stations near Chicago for field day. And on, on the dipole, I could hear him, but it was pretty tough copy. I couldn't hear him at all in the vertical, but he was Q5 on the NVI, NVIS center. That was good to about 250 miles, I figure. Um, there's free tools, which I told you about, that you can use to uh, to see what your uh, local condition is. But to, don't let this stop you from doing it. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Put up the best you can and um, and just have fun. There's a local guy who's a, he's a ham, an engineer, and he has a saying that if everything had to be perfect, there wouldn't be ham radio. And, and that's really true. So... Any questions? Any questions here from Zoomland? A lot of questions. 